Okay, so um, our next speaker in this morning session will be uh, Felix Bartel from um, Faculty of Mathematics at Chemnitz uh, Technical University. Uh, he's a PhD student or a student of um, commonly Ralf Hielscher and uh, Daniel Potts and is working in different fields and one of his um, subjects of interest <coughs> is um, uh, some question from learning theory, and he's going to talk about cross-validation in scattered data approximation. So please, Felix. So first of all, thanks for organizing this event. Thanks for having me, and also thanks for the introduction. As you mentioned, I want to talk about uh, cross-validation, and in order to introduce this concept, let me start off with the setting. So we are in a typical learning scenario. So we have n samples, x coming from some spatial domain omega, and data y. So you can imagine having some unit interval, and then your sample is coming, for instance, from cluster function. Now there exist various methods which now take these samples and try to reconstruct the underlying function or, um, to approximate the data reasonably well. We have seen quite some few in the past, and I think we will also see some in the following days. But we are not that much concerned about how to obtain this reconstruction, but rather the question of how good is this reconstruction? So can I somehow quantify the goodness? So the question is as follows. So if I have given my data and also such a reconstruction algorithm, I can ask for how good is the goodness of fit, which can be quantified by the risk, or if I have exact data, this would correspond to the reconstruction error itself. But as you can see here, um, you would to compute this quantity exactly, you would need to know the underlying distribution or working with exact data, I would, would need to know the function itself, which in practice you usually don't have. So I want basically to approximate this uh, two reconstruction error based off the data set and just the reconstruction model. A very similar problem would be that if you do not only have one model, but you have a whole family of models, usually named hypothesis space indexed by some age. Now you can ask yourselves if you have multiple models, which one is better for the approximation of my data? or if I think of regularization uh, schemes, then there are often parameters involved. I, and I can ask for how can I choose these parameters such that my reconstruction fits the data best. So in this picture, this scheme is depicted. So here on the x-axis, I have my parameters. On the y-axis, I again have, for the goodness of fit, my L2 error. And I can now ask for a parameter which minimizes this reconstruction error. Again, this boils down to somewhat approximating this reconstruction error. But we have only given our data, so we have to work with what we are given. And a method which does this would be, for instance, just using a validation set. So you split your data, let's say you use 90% of the data for training your model and the remaining 10% to then approximate this um, L2 error. Of course, um, the drawback here is that you do not use all your data for training the model. So you actually, some of them are basically use, useless or you use them for approximating the L2 error. And well, you also have to make this test set sufficiently large such that this approximation on the L2 error is sufficiently big. A bit more elaborated approach would be to use cross-validation. So cross-validation now basically does the same thing, but it does it over and over again for different partition links. So here you can see that this test set is another in each of these examples here. And in the end, you will um, average over all of these approximations to the add to error. There are um, different variations of this, and we had a look at leave one out cross validation. 
This was originally introduced in 1974 by a paper of Stone. There are also references therein to similar techniques from before. And uh, it goes as follows. So you compute your reconstruction based off the samples, but you leave individual nodes out, out as the name suggests. So you actually have to train as many models as you have nodes. And the second step, you then evaluate these models in the IF node, so exactly the node which you left out, and compare it to the data value you have given there. And last but not least, you average over these and get in the end the cross validation score. You can see that there are two immediate drawbacks, about, uh, which I want to talk about. The first one, I just told you that you have to compute n different reconstructions, so as many as there are nodes, and working with many nodes, this could be computationally quite unfeasible. So I somehow have to circumvent this. And secondly, well, I tried to explain that it makes somewhat sense, but uh, you can also ask for a theoretical foundation. So how good is uh, this cross validation score actually? So let's start off with the fast computation. So a lot of work has been done in this direction. I just uh, have here some examples. So this is the fast computation for smoothing splines. This is fast computation for nearest neighbors, and here also one for support vector machines. So if you go on Google Scholar, type in cross validation, you get like four million hits, out of which three million are concerned about the fast computation of this quality. So we also wanted our share of that and tried to compute this cross validation score in a fast manner in the context of penalized least scarce estimation. So what is penalized least scarce estimation? If I have given some basis functions, phi k, then my approximation will have this form, so a representation with respect to these basis functions. And these Fourier coefficients are computed by minimizing this function. So what is this first term is a data fitting term, so this f is just a Fourier matrix, so basis functions evaluated at the data nodes. Y is our data, so if you would just minimize over that, that would be just ordinary least squares. Then we have another smoothing term in here, so you can imagine having a Sobolev norm here or something similar. And this lambda, which now determines how these two terms are weighted, so if lambda is rather small, this data fitting term is weighted a bit more, and if lambda is big, then the smoothing term, so we get a smooth approximation. And now it is also very easy to show that you actually can compute this minimizer by just solving this system of linear equations. Okay, so how can I get um, cross-validation now involved here? And for that, I have to make the following definition. So here we have just our reconstruction evaluated at the sampling nodes. And this can be done by the formula from the slide before by multiplying this matrix with the data values. And uh, we will now denote this matrix here by head matrix and uh, with the simple capital H sub lambda. And now in 1979, Golob, Heath and Baba showed that you can compute the cross validation score by this quantity. So what is this? Uh, in the denominator, we have the path component of the residual, now with respect to the full data. And in the denominator, we have one minus HII, where HII are the diagonal entries of this head matrix. So instead of computing as many models as I have samples, I now have only to compute uh, my reconstruction for the full data, but I have to compute these diagonal entries as well. So uh, they play quite an important role. So let's have a closer look at them. What are these? Of course, uh, the diagonal uh, entry of a matrix can be computed by just multiplying with the ith unit vector. And in this context, uh, that means like this ith unit vector on the right hand side means that I have given data which is zero everywhere except on the ith node then multiplying with h lambda actually is now computing my reconstruction. These are these gray lines now for lambda set to different parameters. 
and the ith unit vector from the left hand side means I want to evaluate at that ith node. So I get different parameters here. Of course, I can do this in this fashion. So if I have a fixed node set, I can compute these quantities, but it seems like um, they only depend on the nodes in question. So maybe if I have my nodes given before by some scheme, then I would be able to even compute the closed form of these diagonal entries. And it turns out already in uh, 1996, Tasha and Weyrich showed in the setting of the d dimensional torus. I think they showed it um, for one and two dimensions, but it's analogously for d dimensions as well. For basis functions, they used just the exponential functions. Then for the sampling nodes, we had the full grid. Then the diagonal entries can be computed by this formula. So um, it doesn't even depend on the sampling node in question. So this is quite easy to compute. So instead of computing n models, I can use the formula from Golub, Keith, and Vava, which now uses these diagonal entries, which are also easy to compute. Well, but we are on a workshop with in, in high dimensions. Therefore, I don't think I have to tell you that taking samples at the full queue is a rather bad idea in high dimensions. But we still thought this result is quite nice. So maybe we can generalize it. And so we tried to get to the core of it. And it turns out that given an index set, and if you have now nodes and weights, which form an exact quadrature rule for the difference index set, which is simply, which are simply all frequencies originating from differences from frequencies from the original index set, then I have the same formula as before. So I can compute these diagonal entries in a fast manner. Uh, also the proof is rather short. So by this exact quadrature property, I have that this matrix product is equal to the identity. Therefore, for computing these diagonal entries, I can invert this matrix here very easily. And it is left that this F and this F star basically cancel each other out and I end up with this nice closed form. So now we can put everything together in one algorithm. So if I have given my nodes and weights, which form this exact quadrature rule, if I have given frequency weights, my data, and also the regularization parameter for which I want to compute the cross validation score, now I can do the following. So the first stop, step is basically computing the Tihonov minimizer or penalized least squares estimation itself. Secondly, I evaluate it at the given sampling nodes. And then I compute these diagonal entries with the formula from the slide before. And last but not least, I compute the cross validation score by the formula of Golub, Heath, and Vava. So let's have a look at the uh, computational uh, complexity. The most expensive part certainly is the first step. So but this is uh, computing the penalized least worst estimation itself. And I think I cannot circumvent this anyways. And also, if I have exact quadrature, this inverse here can be computed quite quickly. So basically, the complexity boils down to the multiplication with f itself. All right, then we had a look if we can apply this also to other settings. So the first row here is the result we just had a look at. And it turns out also for the unit interval, where we use the Trebuchet polynomials for a basis, we can do the same. So this, here the diagonal entries have a bit more elaborated form, but it's still possible to compute them in a fast manner. For instance, if I use the fast cosine transform here. And we also showed this for a two dimensional sphere with the spherical harmonics and also for the rotation group with the Wigner D functions. In all of those cases, uh, an important role played that we could use actually an addition theorem. So the claim would be as soon as I have some addition theorem, I'm able to compute these diagonal entries. And furthermore, for uh, fast computation and all of these settings, 
for specific nodes, there exist also algorithms which allow us to compute the matrix vector product with f in a fast manner. So basically, computing the cross validation score is now possible in the complexity n log n plus the cardinality of the index set. So let's get to some numerical examples. Here we have basically the result from which already Tasche and Weyrich knew. So we have a two-dimensional example, equispaced nodes. Uh, it was one million equispaced nodes, sampled our function and added 10% Gaussian noise. And from there, we then, for different parameters of lambda, computed the L2 error, which in practice you cannot do, as well as the cross-validation score. Now with our fast method, and you can see, these two curves uh, resemble each other quite nicely. So instead of minimizing the L2 error, which I cannot do, I can now compute or minimize the cross-validation score and end up with a parameter which is nearly optimal as the one minimizing the L2 error itself. And on the lower right, you can see the reconstruction with lambda set to this optimal parameter here. And well, this is two dimensions. I wanted to do something in high dimensions as well. And if I think about the Toros, what are your rules in high dimensions? I, of course, think about rank one lattices. Um, I think Mark Ivan and Lutz Kemmerer will tell more interesting things about them. So let me just briefly introduce them. They are defined by generating vector and lattice size. And you basically repeat this generating vector over and over again over the torus, and you end up with all these nodes. And they are then this rank one lattice. The nice thing about them is that if you have given a frequency index set i, then there exist algorithms which give you back the generating vector as well as the lattice size, such that I have my exact butcher rule, so I'm able to compute my diagonal and trees in a fast manner. And furthermore, also in this case, the multiplication with f can be carried out by the lattice fast Fourier transform, which is basically using a fast Fourier transform internally, thus is also able to compute this matrix vector product in n log n. For a numerical example in that case, we used the seven-dimensional tensor product of these splines. We sampled it in uh, 1 million rank 1 lattice nodes and added 5% Gaussian noise. For the frequency weights, we used here mixed smoothness weights. And for the index set, this hyperbolic cross, which exactly mimics the decay behavior of the Fourier coefficients of the function I want to approximate. Then I did as before. So I computed the L2 error as well as the cross validation score. And you can see these two curves nearly coincide. So instead of minimizing the L2 error, I can now compute the cross-validation score. And then we ask ourselves, but um, what if I don't have a quadrature rule? Of course, uh, one could try to, given nodes, compute quadrature weights, but that could be computationally expensive or unstable, as I want these weights to be non-negative. Another approach would be um, to use approximate quadrature weights like Voronoi weights. Or also, by these uh, three guys, showed concentration inequalities for random matrices. So, if I have sampling nodes uniformly random on the torus with a certain oversampling factor over the size of the index set, I actually have that this matrix product is nearly or as close to the identity in the spectral norm. And I have this with high probability. And this motivated us to define the following. So here we have the approximated cross validation score. It basically looks as before. So you have, again, like the form of Golopit and Baba. But now this HII has a tilde above here. So, and this is defined as this. So it's basically the formula from before. But remember, we don't have exact quadrature. So this formula doesn't hold exactly, but uh, because we're close with this concentration inequalities, you would be able to show that we are not far off. And for that, I also brought a numerical example, again, two dimensions, 
have the same function from before. I sampled it in 8,000 nodes and added 5% Gaussian noise. And again, computed the L2 error, the approximated cross validation score, as well as the exact cross validation score. And you can see these three curves resemble each other quite nicely. And comparing the approximated to the actual cross validation score, you can see on the border they differ quite a lot. But um, the area where it matters, so where the minima are attained, they are very close to one another. Okay, so with that, we are able to compute the cross validation score in a fast manner. But uh, now the part where we actually show that what we compute actually makes sense. So again, briefly introduce the setting. We have given n samples. Now in this part of the talk, I will assume the samples to originate from a function without noise. And I have my reconstruction model. And I'm asking for the relation of the L2 reconstruction error with this cross validation score. And there is this uh, famous Bakushinsky veto, which says that if I have a method which only relies on the data, so which is purely data driven, like the cross validation score is, then there exists a possible data realization such that my method basically won't work. So we will somehow have to circumvent this. And so far, uh, Golopith and Waba did this, and to circumvent the Bakushinsky veto, they used the expected value. So they showed that the expected value of the risk minus the expected value of the cross validation score can be bounded from above. So they circumvented the Bakushinsky veto by using the expected value. Another approach was taken by Lee in 1987. So for H plus being the minimizer of the risk and H star being the minimizer of the cross validation score, he showed that the fraction of these two quantities goes to, zero, uh, goes to one for the number of nodes going to infinity. So basically saying that these two parameters perform equally in terms of the uh, reconstruction error. But we didn't want to have, uh, or we would like to have a pre asymptotic result. So, maybe something which falls with high probability. And well, that screams for concentration inequalities. So, let me make a quick interlude on concentration inequalities. Very basic one would be hefting. So, you have n random variables taking values in 0, 1, and you have m the expected value of its mean. And then Höfting says that with high probability, all the realizations of this mean are around its expected value. But um, we, only, we do not only want to have this for the mean, but we would like to have it, we to plug in here a more general function. And in order to do that, we have to introduce the concept of C-boundedness. So we say that the function of n variables is C-bounded if this condition holds. So this condition basically being that if I wiggle in one node, then this is still bounded. So it's somewhat related to Lipschitz continuity, but I don't have the difference of the nodes on the right-hand side. And with that, I'm now able to formulate the concentration inequality of mctr meat. Again, I have n random variables now taking values in a more general domain omega. Then I assume uh, for a function f to be c bounded on the whole domain. And I define m to be the expected value of f of the random variables. Then I have, as before, the high probability that uh, the realizations of my random variable are not far off its expected value. Um, Later, I want to plug in the cross validation score or the risk for this f, and I won't be able to show the c boundedness for the whole domain. Therefore, I need another extension. This is uh, more recently, in 2015, showed by uh, Richard Counts. So you have again n random variables, and now you assume your f not to be c bounded on the whole domain, but rather on a, just on a subset, c. 
then usually you assume that subset C to be nearly the whole domain. You also define uh, this number gamma, which is the probability that you're outside of this C, so basically on the border here. So this should be rather small. Then you have uh, the same as before, so with high probability, now this gamma is involved here on the right hand side. You have that uh, realizations of your random variable are not far off of its expected value. Okay, so how can we apply this uh, to our setting? First of all, what will be omega n? Omega n will be the set of all possible samples. And now we have to uh, choose what xi will be. And we constructed xi in the following form. So we assumed xi to be the collection of all samples where I have a, a uniform bound. So uh, it's nice, like uh, Katharina in her talk yesterday talked about, if I do least squares estimation, and she showed the high probability you have a uniform bound. So with that, you are actually exactly in that setting. And uh, I also have a second condition. So I assume my reconstruction algorithm to be C-bounded. So if I wiggle in one node, that won't change as much in, much in my reconstruction. But uh, that second condition actually is mainly for fine tuning, as I can show that I have the second condition implied by the first one with the C2 being equal to two times C1. Okay, and now with that, this set, I'm able to show that the risk as well as the cross validation score is C bounded with these constants. Therefore, I can apply Richard Combs extension of MacDR meet. And let's uh, for now fix this parameter or fix this model H. So this bold line is the expected value. Now MacDR meet says that like 90% of the drawn samples, the risk lands around an interval around this uh, expected value. You can of course do this for multiple models. So I end up with this tunnel. Now you can of course do this with the cross validation score itself too. So I have these two tunnels. But uh, for now I have two separate concentration inequalities, but I promised you I wanted to bring these two concepts together. And this will be done by bringing these two bold lines together, so their expected values. So this is done by this lemma, which says exactly that. So it says that the expected value of the risk is the same as the expected value of the cross validation score. So we can actually overlap the two pictures from the last slide and obtain that these two tunnels are also very close to one another. And with that, I can now formulate our main result. So if I have samples distributed according to this rule, and I have gamma, my fail probability for the uniform bound, then for epsilon bigger than this constant, um, in this constant there is gamma involved and also the C1, which are both quite small, so this should be no restriction. And then we have that with high probability, we can actually bound the difference of cross validation score and L2 error. So instead of computing this L2 error, I can compute the cross validation score, and I'm only off by epsilon with this probability. Okay, so let's have that in a precise setting. And uh, this is a rather simple setting. So it's moving these squares or Shepard's model. Uh, the model looks as follows. So it's basically a local convex combination of the function values. And you have here a kernel involved. And we chose the kernel to be simply the head function with this parameter h here. And this parameter h now determines how narrow or how wide my kernel is. And on the lower right, you see three or three reconstructions of this parameter set to different values. And you immediately see the goodness of the reconstruction very much depends on this parameter H. Okay, so let's get everything together to apply our general machinery. So we need bounds for these three quantities. First one is basically uniform bound on my reconstruction. 
Well, I just told you that um, Shepard's model is basically a local convex combination of the function values. Therefore, I can bound the first thing by the uniform norm of f itself. And then I need um, a uniform bound with high probability. We were also able to show that. So if I have uniformly random nodes and I have a locally supported kernel and I assume f to be literates of constant n, then I can bound the, uni the, the reconstruction error by this literate con uh, constant times the width of the kernel with that probability. So there's an alternating sum, so you just have to believe me that if my kernel is wide enough, then this probability is very close to one. And if my kernel gets a bit more narrow, this probability gets smaller. So with that, we can now formulate our general theorem in the context of Shepard's model. So for assumptions, again, I have the Lipschitz continuity of F. I have my n samples, which are uniformly distributed. I have my locally supported kernel and my failed probability for the uniform board from the slide before. Then for epsilon bigger than the small constant, I have as before that the difference of cross-validation score and the two error is quite small with high probability. So instead of computing the L2 error, I can compute the cross validation score, and I'm not far off. And I, uh, how does this compare to earlier results? So we were actually motivated by a book of these four guys. They did the same in the context of binary kernels, but um, they didn't use the extension of MacDiarmid's inequality, but rather used MacDiarmid's inequality itself. Therefore, they had to choose this gamma to be equal to zero and add a worse bound on uniform error. But uh, using binary kernels, they were able to tune this C2 to behave like one divided by n. And with that, they were able to obtain the following concentration inequality. And um, to put this into context, let's uh, put our result below. So if I compare these two, of course, we have now this gamma involved here, which uh, makes things a bit worse, but usually this is quite small. But in terms of the order, you can see you have here the square root of n, whereas we obtained n to the three halves. So actually, by introducing this constant gamma, we were able to, in a more general context, improve the order by one. And uh, also for that, I brought a numerical example. So just in the one-dimensional case, we sampled the function in, I think it was 10,000 uniform nodes. And then for the 50 different parameters of age, we conducted this experiment a thousand times each. So every one of these dots represents one experiment. And from there, we computed for one the risk, which you can see here on the left hand side, and also the cross validation score, which you can also in this context compute in a fast manner, but that's rather easy and not that interesting. Uh, you can see that for if I have a very wide kernel, my error is a bit bigger and these cluster quite nicely, but if my kernel gets too small, then here you can see outliers start to happen for the risk as well as for the cross validation score. Um, to apply our theory, let's change to a different uh, representation. So here you have this drawn through lines are the mean values of the dots you've seen on the last slide. So the mean values of the cross validation score and the L2 error. And these transparent shapes are where 90% of the experiments landed. And now these dashed lines are our theoretical bounds for that. And then you can see that there is a kink here, which is due to this gamma. And this gamma, this fail probability for a uniform bound will get close to one for two narrow kernels. But this is natural since also a lot of outliers started to happen around that area. Secondly, you can see that we are off by quite a big multiplicative constant. But if you would pull the shape down here, you can see that these shapes resemble each other quite nicely. 
So it seems that we have found the right order for our bound. And here on the right hand side, we have basically the same just for the difference of cross validation score and the risk. So 90% of the uh, data realizations landed below that drawn through line and the dashed line is our bound for that. Here, and with that, we also have a general framework for the theoretical foundation for a cross validation score and applied it in the context of Shepard's model. So and what's left for me to do is to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Felix, for your uh, very interesting talk. Are there comments, questions? Um, I have one. Um, could you go back to slide 34 or 35? This one? Okay. Uh, could you please explain um, the improvement of this concentration result here compared to that existing one? Yeah, so um, firstly, we have a more general setting. So they just showed it for binary kernels. Yeah. And uh, we are worse the, because we have this gamma in here, which is non-zero. But usually this gamma for a sufficiently wide kernel is reasonably small. So you could ignore this gamma. And uh, so what's left to have a look at is this n here, so the behavior of n with respect to this epsilon. So you can see in their bound, they have square root of n, where we have n to the three halves. And this is what I think is an improvement here. Uh, square root, ah, there is a square outside. Okay, now I see the point. Yeah, it was a bit quick, so I could not really see what improvement you mean here, but oh, yeah, now I got it. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, are there further questions? Um, yeah, let me comment on another thing. Uh, another thing, when you do this uh, scattered data stuff and um, you compute this um, cross validation score, then you do not have a fast algorithm anymore, right? So you actually need to to do then um, normal matrix vector multiplications without any structure. Is that correct? Um, if my index set is the full cube, I could, of course, use the non space fast Fourier transform. But yes. if I you would use something like the hyperbolic cross, which I think you have in mind, then no, I cannot use a fast algorithm here anymore. But I mean, essentially, your uh, nodes would then reduce significantly, right? That your yes. new algorithm yes. is then not too bad in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. So computing the cross validation score boils down to the complexity of computing the Tiranov minimizer itself. So you have to do this anyways. Yeah, okay. Um, further questions to Felix? Maybe one question of myself. Although I have the feeling we are the only ones asking questions. Uh, hopefully it's not annoying. Um, so uh, Felix, discuss it later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so your, your your method is somehow used to so it's really a naive question, I guess. So your method is used to approximate the error of your approx of your approximation, right? So you want to approximate the error and not the function itself to some extent, right? Yeah. So you, uh, initially, cross validation was introduced to choose some regularization parameter. But uh, it turns out it actually approximates this reconstruction error, as you said. Yeah. Is, is there a way, or did, did, do you know something about, um, around that, um, to find good point sets out of large data sets? So you know that that's one of the main topics of the school this week. And so do you think it's possible to use methods you have here to somehow find the n best points out of n log n random ones? Because we have no idea how to do that, right? We have, we have n log n random points and want to find n good. And as far as I know, we, we do not even have an approximate method for doing that um, in a somehow efficient way, right? So, so maybe it would be interesting to do that here with this technique. So you think maybe these diagonal entries could have something to do with that? Yeah, that would be an interesting idea, yeah. But I haven't looked into it so far.
I mean, Great, we, thanks. We, we discussed some some strategies to find these n log n, but this is a different project. I mean, um, uh, it certainly does not belong to this uh, talk. But actually, I discussed some strategies with Felix to to actually find that. Uh, for your question, Mario, that there is a paper by uh, Haberstich Perron, and what was the third author? Maybe um, Albert Cohen will talk about that. It is a, a greedy strategy to find out the good nodes. So that there is some people do that, but uh, say heuristically without knowing that it's the best set of points what they get. Can you still hear me, Mario? I can hear you, but okay, very good. most likely you cannot see me because I'm I'm giving you my um yeah. Yeah. Thumbs uh, up all the time. I'm fine with everything. Yeah, um it seems that there is a, a lot of um yeah, uh, a lot of discussion happening with the young participants of that workshop. And in that sense, let me announce the following. Uh, so Mario.